it's about time to get started. I'm Normie Berry with Mississippi State University, and uh, we'll talk about some work we've done as a long term study on bed longevity, it's basically what we wanted to look at corn and soybeans in a rotation system. How can we use no till production on this soils and we use some tillage? We all know that. Uh, one pass tillage and no-till production systems can reduce equipment, labor costs, and overall costs. And uh, the, also the controlled traffic system, and this is what we did this when I mean I'm talking about controlled traffic. I'm talking about keeping the wheel tracks of our tractor and inputs in the same, in the bed firm, not running over the bed. Uh, we can, our, uh, Auburn has shown that we can reduce our soil compaction from 90 to 30 percent of keeping the control traffic system. The other thing, uh, we like to leave crop residue on the surface and work out of Kansas. Say that good uh, crop residue can reduce evaporation by 14 percent if we're in the irrigated system. We can save about three inches of water and reduce our pumping costs. The other thing that will have also has shown that we need uh, about two and a half to around five and a half tons of stover on the soil surface to maintain favorable soil properties. And uh, crop residue also, instead of burning it, it contains some valuable fertilizers. Our objective in this study was to look at corn and soybeans and, and their response, yield response to these tilling systems, and I'll describe those briefly. But we wanted to kind of get a handle on what is a critical bed height for maintaining or maximizing our yield with these two crops. And then how long can we initiate these beds and go into no-till production? Can we do it two years, three years, or, or none at all? And what the long-term effects of these tillage practices on soil organic matter? Our tillage treatments uh, was continuous no-till beds, in other words, flat. This soil is a uh, Leaper silted clay long soil, uh, slope uh, flat, uh, been land farmed about a quarter of a percent slope. Uh, annual, our bed system one, it was an annual fall bed, and we created a five to six inch, eight to nine inch bed, and our 10 inch bed height was our max. And we did that every year, and we did it. We did not reshape the beds to see how long we could maintain yields. Uh, to see how long our bed height and what bed height would necessarily be. We had a tear-till system. Uh, I'll show you a picture of that in a little bit. Running a 12-inch depth, it's an in-row subsoiler, a bed roll system uh, made by Big Mag out of Lubbock, Texas. We ran it every fall, every other fall, and we also looked at running it at 205, 208. This is when our, our yields began to decline and we thought we need to run it again to see whether we can increase our yields. Our planting dates for our corn, they range from March 27th to May 2nd. 2015 is real wet. We usually like to try to get in April to do our corn planting, and soybeans can be the April or early May. It range from April 17th to May 6th. This is a tear till, and if you look, it's a uh, how, the downside of it is it requires about 50 horsepower per row unit. We have a lot of tools on there. We have a culture that runs in front of the, uh, the uh, shank, subsoil shank. That is a bent shank. In other words, if you're a, a straight shank would run right in the middle of the 30 inch row, it's offset, but the, the subsoiler is underneath that row in the center of the row. Then you can see the the culture that runs in front of the bedder, those are about, uh, buster is about nine inch. We like a small uh, buster because we don't, we want to create a wide bed as possible in 38 inch rows. And we got yellow shield furs that help fur that out and the bed roller behind that flattens the top off so it makes it nice, uniform to plan on. Uh, this is the bed uh, roller with our fur shields. And if you look closely, you can see how helps create, it pulls that soil out of that fur and puts it on that bed, that's where you want it. It also helps in a drainage system. This is a spring shot after uh, early spring burn down. You can see the corn residue on the surface. This is what we like to see. Uh, so we 
It protects that soil also from our raindrops that impact it, breaks that energy so we don't have as much soil erosion. And this was done with a bed roller that was done in the fall. Uh, we planted with John Deere 1700 planter with our trash wheels, which are important. And one of the things we ran into, we started this study in 205 of fall. We put in our tillage, we planted in, in the spring of 206. And one of the things we noticed, and uh, this was the days before we had the RTK or GPS systems. If you look closely, you can see how it shifted that planter, pushed it off to the side, even without it. In that three-point hitch, there was not any play in it, but that cord stove was pretty tough to plant through. So we had our thoughts here, how can we solve that problem? And we came up with a chain error. That's just a baseball field error is all it is. And, but we did not run it, let it all the way down. We ran about six rows of spikes touching, running about seven miles an hour. And this is what it looked like. Our broke that corn stubble up, made it much easier to plant through. One thing, uh, corn, as most of you probably know, if you're planting corn and you're on a flat ground, so you need a bed, otherwise you're going to suffer some yield. Now, this is just an illustration here. You can see on the side we have tear till, and on the left was a bed, and the middle is no-till flat. And this is pretty consistent. About seven out of ten years, we're seeing a significant uh, reduction in growth and also in yield. Soybeans, not quite as bad. Four out of ten years, where you see that. We got a good stand, and you can look on the side where we had raised beds, how much better growth we had. We had four out of 10 years that we had a significant yield reduction. When it occurred, about a nine bushel average yield reduction. Look at our results. This is a busy slide. We start off on the left, it's our tillage treatments. The next column is our fall tillage. And you can see these were the, the depths and the years we ran it. The, the no-till, we didn't do anything. The bed roller, uh, we ran an eight to nine inch bed. We ran it every fall. Treatment three there was we ran it in 05 and the fall of 2011. And we looked uh, four, five, and six was the terror till systems, a uh, bed roller system that we used. Continuous, every fall, treatment four. Five was every other year, and six was we done it in 05 and 08 and 2013. We look at the next column, we look at the organic matter. We started out this study in 205, we had a one and a half percent organic matter. In 2015 in the fall, we pulled the soil samples out of each one of those uh, plots, and you can see there wasn't any significant difference statistically. Uh, that, uh, we compared that to no tillage, you can see the tear till, and then it was numerically higher where we ran it every fall. But basically, overall, there wasn't any difference. So we're not affecting organic matter in any sense, even with a one-pass system. Next column on yield, you can see the, the colored ones there, the significantly higher, the teratil ones. If you look at compared to no-till, we're 118 versus teratil, about 139 to 142 bushels. And you can see when we had the bed roll, we run it every year, we ran it. In 05 and 011, there wasn't any significant uh, yield difference. That's a 10 year average. And if we look at the gross returns, you can see there what the gross return average per year was. The next column was the average tillage cost. Our bed roll cost about $8 average. And that's 2015 uh, budget, MSU budget, where we got those numbers from. And we ran it every, uh, we divided up in 5 and 11, about $2 an acre, which is bed roll then. We look at Terratil, uh, every year $17 an acre, and we ran it every other year, producing about nine or eight and a half. And if we look at we run it about every fourth year, we're down to about $4. The important thing, we want to know what the returns are above that tillage cost. They didn't take any account of anything else. We treated everything else the same. So we're basically looking at what's the gross return of, above those tillage costs. And you can see uh, the Terratil, we're at it that's in red there in the far right column. It was 488 uh, bushels, uh, dollars per acre compared to no-till was 413 or $75 difference average over that 10 year period. And if you look at, uh, that's running the Terratil every other year. It, was, it gave us higher returns <coughs> it every year. 
or every uh, fourth year. This is similar results. We looked at soybeans, and then you looked at the slate column, when you looked at organic matter, it was higher. This is typically what we see if we're in a rotation. It's about time to get started. I'm normally here at Mississippi State University, and uh, we talk about some work we've done as a long-term study on bed longevity. It's basically what we wanted to look at corn and soybeans in a rotation system. How can we use no-till production on this soils and we use some tillage in it? We all know that uh, one-pass tillage and no-till production systems can reduce equipment, labor costs, and overall costs. And uh, the, also the controlled traffic system, and this is what we did this when I mean I'm talking about controlled traffic. I'm talking about keeping the wheel tracks of our tractor and inputs in the same in the bed firm, not running over the bed. Uh, we can, our, uh, Auburn has shown that we can reduce our soil compaction from 90 to 30 percent of keeping the controlled traffic system. The other thing, uh, we like to leave crop residue on the surface of work out of Kansas. Say that good uh, crop residue can reduce evaporation by 14% if we're in the irrigated system. We can save about three inches of water and reduce our pumping costs. The other thing that will have also has shown that we need uh, about two and a half to around five and a half tons of stover on the soil surface to maintain favorable soil properties. And uh, crop residue also, instead of burning it, it contains some valuable fertilizers. Our objective in this study was to look at corn and soybeans and, and their response, yield response to these tilling systems, and I'll describe those briefly. But we wanted to kind of get a handle on what is a critical bed height for maintaining or maximizing our yield with these two crops. And then how long can we initiate these beds and go into no-till production? Can we do it two years, three years, or, or none at all? and what the long-term effects of these tillage practices on soil organic matter. Our tillage treatments uh, was continuous no-till beds, in other words, flat. This soil is a leaper silted clay long soil, uh, slope uh, flat, uh, been land farmed about a quarter of a percent slope. Uh, annual, our bed system one, it was an annual fall bed, and we created a five to six inch, eight to nine inch bed, and our 10 inch bed height was our max. And we did that every year and we did it. We did not reshape the beds to see how long we could maintain yields, uh, to see how long our bed height and what bed height would necessarily be. We had a tear-till system. Uh, I'll show you a picture of that in a little bit. Running a 12 inch depth, it's an in-row subsoiler, a bed roll system. Uh, made by Big Mag out of Lubbock, Texas. We ran it every fall, every other fall, and we also looked at running it 205, 208. This is when our, our yields began to decline, and we thought we need to run it again to see whether we can increase our yields. Our planting dates for our corn, uh, they range from March 27th to May 2nd. In 2015, it was real wet. We usually like to try to get in April to do our corn planting, and soybeans can be the April or early May, and it range from April 17th to May 6th. This is a tear till, and if you look, it's a, a high, the downside of it is it requires about 50 horsepower per row unit. We have a lot of tools on there. We have a culture that runs in front of the, uh, the uh, shank, subsoil shank, that is a bent shank. In other words, if you're a, a straight shank would run right in the middle of the 30 inch row, it's offset, but the, the subsoiler is underneath that row in the center of the row. And then you can see the, the culture that runs in front of the bedder, those are about, uh, buster is about nine inch. We like a small uh, buster because we don't, we want to create a wide bed as possible in 38 inch rows. And we got yellow shield furs that help fur that out and the bed roller behind that flattens the top off. So it makes it nice, uniform to plan on. Uh, this is the bed uh, roller with our fur shields. And if you look closely, you can see how 
helps create and pulls that soil out of that fur and puts it on that bed. That's where you want it. It also helps in a drainage system. This is a spring shot after uh, early spring burn down. You can see the corn residue on the surface. This is what we like to see. Uh, so we it protects that soil also from our raindrops that impact it, breaks that energy so we don't have as much soil erosion. And this was done with a bed roller that was done in the fall. Uh, we planted with John Deere 1700 planter with our trash wheels, which are important. And one of the things we ran into, we started this study in 205 of fall. We put in our tillage, we planted in the spring of 206. And one of the things we noticed, and uh, this was the days before we had the RTK or GPS systems. If you look closely, you can see how it shifted that planter, pushed it off to the side, even without it. In that three point hitch, there was not any play in it. But that corn stove is pretty tough to plant through. So we had. Our thoughts are how can we solve that problem? And we came up with a chain hair, that's just a baseball field hair is all it is. And but we did not run it up, let it all the way down. We're running about six rows of spikes touching, running about seven miles an hour. And this is what it looked like. Our broke that corn stubble up, made it much easier to plant through. One thing uh, corn as most of you probably know if you're planting corn and you're on a flat ground so you need a bed, otherwise you're going to suffer some yield. Now, this is just an illustration here. You can see on the side we have tear till, and on the left was a bed, and the middle is a no till flat. And this is pretty consistent. About seven out of ten years, we're seeing a significant uh, reduction in growth and also in yield. Soybeans, not quite as bad. Four out of ten years, where you see that we've got a good stand, and you can look on the side where we had raised beds how much better growth we had. We had four out of 10 years that we had a significant yield reduction. When it occurred, about a nine bushel average yield reduction. Look at our results. This is a busy slide. We start off on the left, it's our tillage treatments. The next column is our fall tillage. And you can see these were the, the depths and the years we ran it. The, the no-till, we didn't do anything. The bed roller, uh, we ran an eight to nine inch bed. We ran it every fall. Treatment three there was we ran it in 05 and the fall of 2011. And we looked uh, four, five, and six was the terror tilled systems, a uh, bed roller system that we use continuous every fall. Treatment four, five was every other year, and six was we done it in 05 and 08 in 2013. We look at the next column, we look at the organic matter. We started out this study in 205, we had a one and a half percent organic matter. In 2015 in the fall, we pulled the soil samples out of each one of those uh, plots, and you can see there wasn't any significant difference statistically. Uh, that, uh, we compared that to no tillage, you can see the terror till, and then it was numerically higher where we ran it every fall. But basically, overall, there wasn't any difference. So we're not affecting organic matter in any sense, even with a one-pass system. Next column on yield, you can see the, the colored ones there are the significantly higher, the terratill ones. If you look at compared to no-till, we're 118 versus terratill, about 139 to 142 bushels. And you can see when we had the bed roll, we run it every year, we ran it. In 05 and 011, it was any significant uh, yield difference. That's a 10 year average. And if we look at the gross returns, you can see there what the gross return average per year was. The next column was the average tillage cost. Our bed roll cost about $8 average. And that's 2015 uh, budget, MSC budget, where we got those numbers from. And we ran it every, uh, we divided up in 05 and 011, about $2 an acre, which is bed roll then. We look at Terratil uh, every year $17 an acre and we ran it every other year reducing about nine or eight and a half and if we look at we run it about every fourth year we're down to about four dollars. The important thing we want to know what the returns are above that tillage cost. They didn't take any account of anything else. We treated everything else the same. So we're basically looking at what's the gross return of, above those tillage costs and you can see uh, the Terratil we're at it that's in red there in the far right column. 
was 488 uh, bushels uh, dollars per acre compared to no-till was 413 or $75 difference average over that 10 year period. And if you look at, uh, that's running the till every other year, it, was, it gave us higher returns running <coughs> it every year or every uh, fourth year. This is similar results. We looked at soybeans, and then you looked at the slate column, when you looked at organic matter, it was higher. This is typically what we see if we're in a rotation uh, with soybeans that follows corn, we're going to see that organic matter jump up four or five tenths of a percent. But then if we flip over to corn the next year, uh, we're back down to about a one and a half percent. So not much, much change. It, in the Mid-South, it's very difficult to, to increase organic matter. But it can, in a small amount of organic matter, can improve uh, the soil properties and functionality of that soil. We're looking at the next column there, and the, the average yield at 10 year period is 52 <coughs> bushels for no till. And we look uh, at the bed row was 55 a annually. Uh, about 05 and 11 was any statistically different, 54 bushels. And we look at terra till every year was 57. We ran it every other year was 57 also. And we ran it every uh, about every fourth year, you can see it was 55. Uh, the tear till annually or every other year gave us significantly higher yield of a 10 year average. We flip over the tillage costs are the same as it was in the corn. If you look to the far right column, you can see what the, the uh, returns above our tillage cost was. Tear till every year, other year was $475 return above tillage cost. We look compare that to no-till was a $45 difference, $45 higher. And you can see it was higher than if we ran it tear till every year or if we ran a tear till every four years. So to kind of summarize as I indicated earlier, and most of you know that corn is much more responsive to beds than soybeans. And there are some out of those 10 years we got a significant response on beds. And we look at soybeans, we only had four out of 10. But again, those four out of 10, those four years, there was about a, a nine bushel year uh, yield difference. So when you get those wet springs, that's when it affects soybeans uh, the most, when you're, it just has emerged and, and in that early growing season. And number two there, no-till uh, production is possible based on our data. I didn't go through all the data, but we, uh, summing it up about four inch high if you need to maintain that in the spring when you go out to plant. And you can probably that average out about four to five years on bed height. And on sill loans, this was not part of this study, but we found we can do about one year and on these 38 inch beds and we need to reshape those beds. But however, when we look at the economics of the territory applied every year, both corn and soybeans, uh, gave us significantly higher returns uh, uh, than uh, if we did it every fourth, three or four year every year. And the fourth item there is that we didn't have any influence over the organic matter in that 10 year period between those different tillage systems. So I'll be glad to take any questions or anything you got. This kind of sums up about 10 years of work on some play loan. Yes, sir. You figure out the rotation every other year on your tear tool thing there. You do it in corn or soybeans, does it make a difference? They if it was me, I would prefer to do the corn, in row sets all the stuff that I do in my bed, uh, soybeans, no till. Uh, this corn is pretty good. in front of your corn. And, uh, yeah, I, and I do try to do it in the fall. Yes. Now this is dry, this is not irrigated. We got a study on the year. Yeah, this, this is all dry land? This is dry land. Uh, Irrigating uh, this work in Stoneville on none of the cell phone soils and did not get a response. Well, we got a no-till on old beds. We can do it every other year. And I was talking to Jason Crutch, and that's about what he was seeing, not any response uh, with irrigating. Uh, the most significant thing in your irrigating is having a, a good bed Therefore, I did drill, but I think that's the most significant. I don't know yet. Uh, 
how much work has been done with scissors. That's the one I think uh, on Terry Field scissors may stretch that. And they've done some work. How, how much data they collect, I'm not sure. So I would caution and say that no, you won't if you run an in road sensor. I know there's some growers in the Delta that are doing that. Run it in the fall and then still the rear game. So that's, that's something that I think some real work needs to be done to really connect it down. So you're saying that. I'm following you. If you're irrigating it, running the subsoil down through the region, really going to help you one way or another. The data suggested that it wasn't going to go. I, I would still, I'd like to see a bunch of data on the ground. And I think sensors can, my thinking is, I think sensors would using sensors to determine how we're going to stay in the stone and what's done without sensors. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So I would caution and say I wouldn't go that far. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. I definitely need some more to work more than in depth data. So. But there's a hole when you start using sensors, well, I find my work, there's a hole. You get much more precise than you do just guessing with the weather and it's dry and you need any water. And that's the way it was done at Stonewall and so on. So. Any other questions? If not, I'm going to turn, turn over to my friend and neighbor uh, from uh, Nelson, Mississippi. Mr. Coggin, he's been talking about his farming operation and how no field has influenced his farming out operation. He said, fall is corn. We're going to see that organic matter jump up at four or five tenths of a percent. But then if we flip over to corn the next year, uh, we're back down to about a one and a half percent. So not much, much change. It, in the Mid-South, it's very difficult to, to increase organic matter. But it can, a small amount of organic matter can improve uh, the soil properties and functionality of that soil. If we look at the next column there, the, the average yield at 10 year period is 52 <coughs> bushels for no till. And if we look uh, at the bed row, was 55 a annually. Uh, about 05 and 011 was in a statistically different 54 bushels. If we look at Terry Till, every year is 57. We ran it every other year was 57 also. And we ran it every, uh, about every fourth year, you can see it was 55. Uh, the Terry Till annually or every other year gave us significantly higher a yield of that 10 year average. We flip over to the tillage costs are the same as it was in the corn. If we look to the far right column, you can see what the uh, the uh, returns above our tillage cost was Terry Till every year, other year was $475 return above tillage cost. If you look, compare that to no till, it was a uh, $45 difference, $45 higher. And you can see it was higher than if we ran it Terry Till every year or if we ran a Terry Till every four years. So, Kind of summarize as I indicated earlier, and most of you know that corn is much more responsive to beans than soybeans. And there are some out of those 10 years we've got a significant response on beans. And we look at soybeans, we only had four out of ten. But again, those four out of ten, those four years are about a, a nine bush a year uh, yield difference. So when you get those wet springs, that's when it affects soybeans uh, the most when you it just has emerged and and in that early growing season. Number two there, no-till uh, production is possible based on our data. I didn't go through all the data, but we uh, summed it up about four inch high if you need to maintain that in the spring when you go out to plant. And you can probably add average out to about four to five years on bed high. And on silt loans, this was not part of this study, but we found we can do about one year and on these 38 inch beds, and we need to reshape those beds. But, however, when we look at the economics of the tear till applied every year, both corn and soybeans uh, gave us significantly higher returns uh, uh, than uh, if we did it every four, three or four year every year. And the fourth item there is that we didn't have any influence over the organic matter in that 10 year period between those different tillage systems. So I'll be glad to take any questions or anything you got. This kind of sums up about 10 years of work on some of the play level. 
Yes, if you figure out how to rotate your every other year on your here to the thing there. You do it in corn or soybean, it would make a difference. If it was me, I would prefer to do the corn, in row sets all the stuff that I do in my bed, uh, soybeans, no till, all that. This corn is pretty much in front of your corn. Yeah, and I do kind of do it in the fall. Yes. Now, this is dry land, it's not irrigated. We got a study on the year. Oh, this, is, this is all dry land? This is dry land. Uh, irrigated. Uh, this work at Stoneville on another was so long, so long, and did not get a response. Well, we got the no-till on well, no old beds, we can do it every other year. And I was talking to Jason Crutz, and that's about what he was seeing, not any response in, uh, with irrigating. Uh, the most significant thing if you're irrigating is having a, a good bed there for ideal growth, and I think that's the most significant. I don't know yet. Uh, how much work has been done with scissors? That's the one I think uh, on the Terra scissors may stretch that. And they've done some work. How, how much data they collect, I'm not sure. So I would caution and say that no, you won't if you run it in row sets on. I know there's some growers in the Delta that are doing that. Running it in the fall and, and still their ear game. So that's that's something that I think some real work needs to be done to really nail it down. So you're saying if I'm following you, that if you're irrigating running the subsoil down through the region, really going to help one way or another. The data is suggesting that in what we've got, but I, I would still I'd like to see a bunch of data on the ground. And I think centers can. My thinking is I think since we're using sensors to determine I work at Stone and what's done without sensors. So I would caution and say I would not go that far and say no, you won't be expected to uh, definitely need some more to work more than in depth later. So if there's a hole when you start using sensors, well I find my work that hole you get much more precise than you do just guessing with the weather and it's dry and you need any water. And that's the way it was done at Stoneville and so on. So. Any other questions? If not, I'm going to turn it over to my friend.